sing verse 1. Arise, my soul, remember this. He took my sin and he buried it no longer. That save my soul. All else is lost. All else is lost. When the grip of fear it has no hold, has no hold on me. So where, oh death, oh where is your sting? No longer I who lives now Yeshua. for your glory all all of this for your glory all of this all all of this for your glory so all of this for your glory
Okay, we have a special treat for everyone. You can be seated, unless you're not supposed to be seated during this time. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him a room. And heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing.
Great job. Give him a bow, guys. Yeah, that was amazing. Give him a hand. It was even better the fifth time. Now, Miss Page, uh, Miss Page Cohen choreographed, directed, has been after congregation for about four or five weeks now, rehearsing this. So, Miss Page, can you come up here real quick? We just want to thank her. Tonight, we're going to be doing this dance one more time. So this was just the, well, you got it five times this morning. But this was just, <laughs> the main show is tonight. So we invite you to come back out. We want to present, is this, we want to present Miss Page. Thank you so much for everything you've invested in and poured into our children. We love you, Coens. Thank you. Well, as the worship team makes their way back up, um, I'll also invite Miss Tanya. Oh, there you are. Tanya up to dismiss our children. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Wow. As they were dancing and praising the Lord, I had, I had a vision of them praising the Lord in heaven, Amen. holding palms in their hands and saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lamb. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let us bless again the children that are be going to be dismissed to, to receive the word uh, of the Lord and uh, pray for our tithes and offerings. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these young souls. Thank you for their hearts. Thank you for their willing to serve you, to obey you, to, um, to love you with all their hearts and minds and souls. Father, we thank you for them and we bless them as they go and receive your word and receive more of your light, more of your wisdom, more of your love so they can give it to the world that is in darkness, oh God. Thank you for blessing them with your word, blessing them with your presence during their uh, time of, um, of, uh, of listening, time of studying the word, of listening to you, what you have to say to them. We thank you, God, for them, for each and every one of them, young and not so young, oh God. Thank you, and we pray in the mighty name of Jesus. And um, we want to pray and thank the Lord for our tithes and offerings and the Lord for giving us. Hallelujah. Father, you say, give, and it shall be given unto you. Father, we give out of a thankful heart, of a thankful soul for who you are, for what you have done for us, for giving us your son and for giving us eternal life, but also for giving us material things so we can serve you better and that we can participate in furthering your kingdom in this, in this land, in this world, oh God, thank you. We give to you in praise and worship, in adoration, because you are mighty, you are glorious, you are the one and only God whom we worship and we love with everything that we are, with everything that we have. And this is just given back to you. May it, may it serve to your glory and to your, the advancement of your reign. In Jesus' mighty and glorious name, amen. So all children today are dismissed, all children of all ages, well, up to 12. Uh, sorry, not all of you, um, kids at heart, uh, downstairs, okay? <laughs> we can stand up and continue to worship. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevent. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. And my God will never fail. Oh, my God will never fail. Cause I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to the Lord Oh, I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle 
I'm real to you, oh God. <laughs> we trust in you with everything that we are holding on to. We just release it. And there's power in the mighty name of Yeshua. Every war he wages, oh, he will win. And I'm not backing down from any giant. Oh, cause I know. for us. Thank you, God. Because you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant say you take and you turn it for good come on sing it out and you turn it you take what the enemy meant for evil and he turns it for our good and he turns it for his glory still speaking and he is still speaking and depositing sweet words depositing his encouraging words depositing his voice into us
God, you are great. You are great. Lord, we thank you that you are you fight our battles. We thank you that we can come to you and trust in you. We thank you that we can lay everything down before you and say, God, I can't do this. I can't do this on my own. We thank you that you come because your burden is light. Your burden, your yoke is light. Your burden is light. And you come and you lift it up from us. God, we trust you with our children. We trust you with our families. We trust you with this nation, with our communities, with the people that are hurting around us. We thank you that you are fighting their battles, that you fight our battles. We thank you, God, that we don't just have to trust in man and in material things, God. We get to trust in you. We get to trust in the God who is great, who is great. You are a great God. You are a great God. And yes, if, uh, we have so many things that we are giving to him and trusting him with personally and also <laughs> spiritually and also with everything that is happening today in our land, in this land. But God, God is greater. And he is our fighter. He fights for us. He is our defender. And thank God. We thank him. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for being with us. We thank you, Lord, for being our present help. The heavens are telling, telling the earth how great you are and we are responding we're responding to your love the oceans are rising they're rising and falling at your God, how great you are. My God, how great you are. How great, how great you are. Sing, my God, how great you are. My God, how great you are. How great, how great you are. He is a great God. He is so great.
like you there is no one else like you and if there's anything we can say this morning is that you are great you are a great God you are marvelous you are majestic in all of your ways and you amaze us God you amaze us just by the works of your hands all of the things that you create all of the things that you do is just beyond our our imaginations it's beyond sometimes what even we can express in words and we just we just want to say that we love you and that you are great and we love you God we love you thank you for loving us thank you for seeing us thank you for all that you do Thank you for who you are. Thank you for who you are, oh God. My God, how great you are. How great you are. How great you are. God, prepare us for the next thing <laughs> as we want to receive your words. Make our hearts ready, our ears ready to listen, our minds alert and receptive to hear what you want to say to us this morning. We receive you and we receive your words. We are open and ready to hear from you. And we pray that you just continue to have your way in this service this morning and throughout today. In the name of Yeshua, we pray, amen. Let's sing the Shema together. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad
You may be seated. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris. I'll be reading the uh, weekly Bible readings today from the Torah, the Prophets, and the New Testament. I'll be reading just selections from uh, each of the chapters. Um, I'll be starting with the Torah portion, and we'll be reading from Genesis, um, chapter 36, verse 36. Uh, th sorry, chapter 37, verse 37, and 38, 2 to 6. Um, Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household and of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Um, now I'm going to read from the Haftarah, which is from the book of Amos this week, uh, Amos 2, uh, six to 10, verses 6 to 10. For three sins of Israel, even for four, I will not relent. They sell the innocent for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. They trample on the heads of the poor as on uh, the dust of the ground and deny justice to the oppressed. Father and son use the same girl, and so profane my holy name. They lie down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. In the house of their God they drink wine taken as fines. Yet I destroyed the Amorites before them, though they were tall as the cedars and as strong as the oaks. I destroyed their fruit above and their roots below. I brought you up out of Egypt and led you 40 years in the wilderness to give you the land of the Amorites. Because we believe that Yeshua, Yeshua is our Messiah and Savior, I'm also reading a portion from the New Testament, John uh, 10, uh, 10, 23, verses 23 to 30. Yeshua was in the temple courts walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews who were there gathered around him saying, how long will you keep us in surprise? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Yeshua answered, I did tell you, but you do not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify for me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. The sheep listen to my voice, I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall not perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Chris. And good morning. And Chag Sameach. Wonderful, well, wonderful. Nice day to uh, celebrate Hanukkah together. Um, we're going to go into that. I had a little bit of a conflict. Are we going to jump over the last item and the last room? Huh? Exactly. Are we going to jump over the Holy and Holies and like, keep it on pause? We're going to go back to it next week and, and do a more Hanukkah theme uh, sermon today, um, and then I was like, you know what, we'll go back to Hanukkah next week, and going to go through uh, the tabernacle uh, this week, uh, as we are really coming to the final destination, uh, the Holy of Holies, or since we've been focusing on the different items of the tabernacle, 
the Ark of the Covenant, and the Mercy Seat. So grab your Bibles. Uh, there's a lot of scripture we're going to go through. We're actually going to start in 2 Samuel uh, this time, um, as we're starting to talk about uh, the, the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, we're going to look at 2 Samuel 6 first and take it from there. God, we thank you so much for, for this time, and Lord, we we thank you for bringing us together and worshiping your name. God, we, we praise your name because you are the only one who deserves our praise, who is the only one who is great and worthy of our praise. And God, it is so, it, it, just a wonderful testimony to, to see uh, the children full of joy for you as well and uh, doing that dance for us and also for you, God. This is not just a performance, but we pray that this would uh, glorify you as well. And Lord, as we go into that last final uh, room and look at this final uh, item of the tabernacle or the temple, God, I pray that you would uh, just continue to draw us closer to you as we talk about being in your presence today getting really into your presence. Lord, I, I pray that, this, uh, that you would have a new revelation for us today, for every single one today. Whatever we know, whatever we don't know, whatever we uh, have to grow into, that you would re reveal a new step for us in order to get even more intimate with you. In Yeshua's name, amen. So Second Samuel... Six, And we are at the point where, where David is already uh, in Jerusalem and uh, the Ark of the Covenant was taken away for some time uh, by the Philistines or Philistines and um, Israel received it back um, and we're not going to go too much into that. It's actually a funny, well, funny story uh, as well, how, how God actually made that work, how they freely said... You'll, you'll take it back. Um, so, uh, at that point, the, the Ark of the Covenant was uh, in Beit Shemesh. And David wanted to bring it to Jerusalem. And this is what it's all about here in these uh, first seven verses. It says, again, David gathered all the choice men of Israel, 30,000. So, he gathered 30,000 people. And David arose and went with all the people who were with him uh, from Baalah, uh, Judah, to bring up from there the ark of God, whose name is called by the name the Lord of hosts, who dwells between the cher cher cherubim. So they set the ark, so they set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, and Uzzah and Ahio. The sons of Abinadab drove the new cart, and they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, accompanying the ark of God, and Ahio went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel played music before the Lord, and all kinds of instruments of fir wood, fir wood and, her, and harps and stringed instruments and tambourines on sistrums and on cymbals. And when they came to Nahon's threshing floor, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. Then the, ang then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah, and God struck him. He struck him there for his error, and he died there by the ark of God. There is a lot of good intentions here in that story and a lot of mistakes that happened. And my first short conclusion is that God is not a God of good intentions. He's a God of obedience. And as we go through um, uh, Scripture and, and take it apart a little bit and, and see what, what God had in mind here for, for the ark and also later on for the holy holies where the ark uh, was we're gonna we're not gonna go back here but if you want you can go back 
uh, later this afternoon or this week and read that section again and point out some of the mistakes uh, that they all made, beginning with David, uh, who gathered 30,000 people to get this ark back to Jerusalem. We're going to see what one, one mistake here is that God appointed people to carry that ark and to take the ark, not, just not everybody's business. That's how holy uh, that ark was. Also, I kind of tried to read over this nonchalant, uh, but the writer here says that God who dwells between the cherubims, that's kind of a, you read through this and it's like, okay, God dwells there? Like, how, how is that happening? And how is this like, just like, okay, he, he like it's just, it's, it's mind-boggling to me how he's just there and then they try to move the, the ark on a new card and again, lots of good intentions, lots of music, very festive, uh, but one mistake here and it killed uh, one of the sons here. So let's go back, let's go to the very beginning of getting an understanding of the ark and of the holy of holies and for this I have a little video for you. It's um, Joshua Aaron, who many of you probably know, a musician, songwriter, singer. Um, he is taking us uh, on that final uh, path from the beginning of the tabernacle. Again, it's in Timna Park. It's one of the replicas there. And we enter it in, and when the video started, we are already on the court, and we go item by item again. You see the altar, you see... Um, every item again, and he actually takes us into the Holy of Holies uh, on that little journey. We walk. This is the altar. You continue walking, and here the, the cleansing would be happening. It gives you also, again, an idea of the dimensions. We go in into the holy place. You have the lampstand, the bread, the altar of incense from last week. And then this is the Holy of Holies with the Ark of Covenant. Okay, so just, again, helps us to get an idea of the dimensions. This is how it could have been. And gets us to the final place, uh, the Ark of the Covenant. So let's, let's read. And we're going to start in Exodus 26, where we learn about the setup of the tabernacle again. Not just the tabernacle, but that final curtain, the veil that, that we saw here, um, where we just went through. So we are in Exodus 26, verse 31. You shall make a veil woven of blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine woven linen. It shall be woven with an artistic design of cherubim. You shall hang it upon the four pillars of acacia wood overlaid with gold. Their hooks shall be gold upon four sockets of silver, and you shall hang the veil from the claps. Then you shall bring the Ark of Testimony, just another name for the Ark of Covenant, in there, behind the veil. The veil shall be a divider for you, between the holy place and the most holy place. Okay, this is important. The veil shall be a divider for you between the holy place and the most holy. You shall put the mercy seat upon the ark of the testimony in the most holy. You shall set the table outside the veil and the lampstand across from the table, so the table of showbread, on the side of the tabernacle toward the south. And you shall put the table on the north side. You shall make a screen. Okay, let's, let's stop here. So this just gives us a little bit of an idea. Set up. God is very specific. This, the lampstand has to be here. The showbread has to be there. Veil, covering, holy place, most holy place. Okay? So in order to get a little bit of an understanding what the holy of holies is, we're going to go to Hebrews. Hebrews 
9, and you, if you follow on your, on your Bible, it's going to be a lot of back and forth here. Uh, in Hebrews 9, verse 6 and 7. Now, when these things had been thus prepared, the pre so when the priests set this all up, the priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle, performing their services. But into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. The holy... Okay, sorry, I'm always going one verse too far. Um, so here again, we, we read and learn how, how all the priests, that they were manning the holy place. But only the high priest was allowed to go into the holy, most holy. And only once a year. On what day? Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Once a year he would go in and make a, well, sprinkle, not make a sacrifice, but sprink, uh, sprinkle blood on the holy, uh, on the mercy seat. So here is my, my deepest question for today. How did they clean the most holy? And that's a joke a little bit, but in my head I'm like, huh, I mean, everything gets dusty. Everything, like, would, even with the blood on the mercy seat, would somebody come, would the, whole, uh, would the high priest clean it up afterwards? Or are we, would they have been looking at uh, the, this beautiful ark sprinkled with blood every single year and just a, a testimony of God's continuous love? And forgiveness. Um, obviously, uh, in Judaism, there are some ideas how this was done. Uh, in the Mishnah, for example, one idea is that they repelled uh, somebody, the cleaner, from the ceiling down uh, to uh, whatever, just to, to not, the point was not to, to enter it, but not touching the floor. Uh, and so some ideas um, how how this was maybe cleaned, and maybe it wasn't clean, okay? So the Bible is not really, doesn't really care. Uh, it seems like God doesn't, it's not, not of his main thought, how, how the most holy place is being cleaned up. Um, but just a question that occurred, and when I was doing some digging online, it's like I wasn't the only one, it seems like, who had that question uh, on, on mind uh, when studying this. So, holy of holies, uh, only the high priest goes in. The only uh, item in there uh, is the Ark of the Covenant. The veil is separating the holy place from the most holy. And why? Why was there a separation? Why was there a separation uh, between the most holy place where, where God was, was dwelling in and the rest of the tabernacle? Well, we get some, uh, some information about that and some answers maybe um, from Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. Where is this, why is the separation needed? So here it says in Isaiah 59, Behold, the Lord's hand isn't, isn't shorted, is not shortened, that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. It's the sin that separates us. It's not that God wants to be separated and it's like, once enough, you guys, is enough. I like you, I don't like you as much. Once, come, come once a year. Um, no. Our sin separates us. God is too pure to look evil. And this is actually what it says in Habakkuk uh, chapter 1 verse 13. You are pure, you are of pure eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. God had to separate us, himself, because of sin. Let's look at the ark. We've been talking about the ark for quite a bit. 
Let's look at the ark. Let's turn to Exodus 25. How to build the ark. Three verses in 10, 11, and 12 from Exodus 25. And they shall make an ark of acacia wood. Two and a half cubits shall be its length. A cubit and a half its width. And a cubit and a half its height. Translated, it was about one, one meter and 15 centimeters, or 45 inches long, and 70 centimeters wide and high. Okay, so it wasn't, it wasn't a huge thing, but a good size. We have a picture here. This is how it could have looked like. Okay, let's find my place here. And you shall overlay it with pure gold inside and out. That is unique as well. You shall overlay it so that it was, was overlaid with gold inside as well. You shall cast, sorry, and you shall overlay it with pure gold inside and out. You shall overlay it and shall make it a molding of gold all around. You shall cast four rings of gold for it and put them in its four corners. Two rings shall be on one side and two rings on the other side. Poles would go through and you can carry it. Speaking of carrying, again, I mentioned that earlier, um, God appointed a family, basically, or a, tr a, a, yeah, a, small, a, a small family, and the descendants of that family would be the carriers of the ark, the sons of Kohath. And who, speaking of the ark, who actually remembers, um, and that's a question you can raise your hand, who remembers what was actually inside the ark. Okay, one thing is more obvious. Okay, shout it out. What's what's the first thing? Okay, I heard different things. Manna, very good. So there was a, a pot with man, manna inside. The tablets. And yes, very good. And Aaron's uh, rod that started to bud. Okay, so we have the the tablets of the. Ten test, uh, commandments. Uh, we have uh, the pot with a sample of manna, and we have the we have Aaron's rod uh, that started to bud. And the, yes, not inside, but we get there. So that's inside the ark. That's the ark, and then we have the mercy seat, uh, which it's a funny name, but the mercy seat uh, is the lid with uh, the, the two carabims on top of that, or on that lid. Um, do we actually have something there? Let me see. Okay, uh, you have to just have to go with that explanation. I don't have a scripture actually selected how to build um, the mercy seat, but the mercy seat is basically the lid that goes over the ark. So it's two pieces that we're talking about here. And um, on, the, on the lid were two carabims. They were facing each other. Their, their wings were spread, as you can see here, to, toward one another. And it says God's presence was on the mercy seat. Okay, this is where his presence was. This is maybe where the, the idea of a seat comes from because maybe in our minds, God needs to sit somewhere. Uh, but he's resting or hovering over that place. Mercy seat. Where does that maybe strange name come from? But in Hebrew, uh, it, it means that the word means something like to cover, which makes sense. It's a, it's a lid. It covers, or it's a cover for something. Um, but also a piece, cleanse, or to cancel or make atonement for it. And this is really uh, the important part here. Again, we remind ourselves, the high priest came into that place once. And not just the place, but before the Ark of the Covenant, where God, God's presence was. 
That's where he was, present. Very hard maybe to, to imagine for us, but this is where he was. And he would go there once a year and to sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat for the atonement of, for himself and for the people of Israel. On Yom Kippur, on the Day of Atonement. So now we covered all, we covered the idea of uh, the most holy place. We covered the idea of the Ark of the Covenant, what this is all about or what's in it and what's happening there. And we understand that God, this was the, the place where God was dwelling. When he was with the Israelites, when he was with, in the tabernacle later uh, in Jerusalem, or in the temple in Jerusalem, this was his dwelling place. And I want to go back to the veil that separated God or the, holy, the most holy place from the rest. And our, the, the title of this series is Through the Tabernacle into the Presence of God. And we, we've picked it up from the very beginning how every single item and every single, like even the entrance, uh, has something to do with Yeshua. So in other words, through the tabernacle, with Yeshua into the presence of the Lord. And the, uh, not the final piece, but one of the final actions that was necessary was that this veil needed, in, at least from God's opinion, it, it needed to come to get away. It was in the way from, uh, from God uh, to his people, to us. And you all know this, what happened. When Yeshua died, this veil was torn. And we, I just want to read this, although you all, it's a very well-known scripture. Uh, but in Matthew 27, in verse 50, it says, And Yeshua cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked and the rocks were split. So Yeshua dies... At the same time, the veil tours into two different pieces. The point here is not that the veil is destroyed, okay? The, the point is that the way into God's presence was opened up through Yeshua. Yeshua made the way in for us into God's presence. What I like about this picture and about the, the tabernacle, or back then it was actually the temple, there was an earthquake. Things happened during that hour when he died. Lots of things happened. The, the entire temple could have collapsed. All the pieces could have been shattered. Altar, uh, the, the, the lampstand, the, 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 the table, whatever. All that have, could have sh uh, could have shattered, but the only thing that, at least what we know, the only thing that happened was the veil was torn. Meaning, at, at least to me, uh, it doesn't take away all the other items, or um, it doesn't take away all the, 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 the in interpretations or meanings of what what these items stand for. Again, um, I hope we made a point and we got the message across that we're not talking about the item, we're not talking about the altar, uh, where we physically now have to go back and, and sacrifice animals or have to cleanse our hands or whatever. Uh, the important part with this message was uh, what these items stand for. Okay? And these things were not uh, abolished or taken away. We still need to accept Yeshua as our sacrifice. Amen. 
we still need to cleanse ourselves. We still see Yeshua as the light of the, of the earth. We still understand that he, that, he gives, that he is the bread of life. We still understand that when we come uh, closer into God's presence, uh, worship and adoration is, is needed. So all these things are still in place, but the presence, the, the way into God's presence was now opened. And I want to tie this and, and close this series uh, with a few more scriptures uh, that where we will hopefully see the, the full picture of this. Where, you, where God himself, he calls us a temple. He says in, in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? Why? Because he is in us. God, the Holy Spirit, is in us whom you have from God. We are, you are. If you believe in, your, in God and you have accepted Yeshua as your Messiah and the Holy Spirit is living in you, you are the temple of God. This is how beautiful this is. And I hope with, uh, with this sermon series, uh, we understand and, and maybe take it even more serious what this means. What does it mean that God lives in us? We say this, we read this. Um, in 2 Samuel, the author writes it kind of nonchalant. The, the, the presence of the Lord is on the mercy seat. Great, we get to the next verse and somebody dies. This catches our attention. Um, but what does it mean that God is living in you? That God's presence is here. Because God has not changed. His, his character has not changed. His presence has not changed. But people used to die when they got too close. Or when the wrong person walks in to the most holy place. This person would have died. Number one, because of obedience, but also disobedience, but also because God's presence is so thick and I just hope that's a little bit of a takeaway from us that we can understand. Yes, uh, it is great. God is always available. We can always call on God uh, quickly. And emergency prayers are great and important. But there is also a time where we need to go a little bit deeper and take a little bit more time and walk into God's presence. And this is just one idea through the tabernacle how this can be done john 14 23 says yeshua says uh, here in a conversation to someone if anyone loves me he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him god will come to you when you love him, this is a promise. He will make your life, your, your body, his home. And this is a very nice and friendly and warm way of saying it. He makes your, your body, your, your life, his home. But it takes also a little bit away the... the, the how of the, the power of this. He makes your body his home. He is present in you. God is in you. And he encourages us wherever we can, wherever he can, to to, to allow ourselves to get into his presence. And I want to close with Hebrews 10, 
verse 19 and 20. And then Hebrews 9, 10 is full of um, the, the author or the Holy Spirit leading the author back to the tabernacle or back to the temple, to the entire setup. And he says here, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Yeshua, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience on our bodies washed with pure water. And this is exactly what used to happen in the Holy of Holies. And God brought this into all of our lives. Every one of us individually gets to go into the presence of the Lord. There's not this high priest, there's not a rabbi, there's not a, a pastor who does it for you. You have to do it yourself and you have the privilege of doing it yourself and enjoying God's presence. What a wonderful gift. What a gift that we have. And including myself, I think we sometimes take that a little bit too lightly or Maybe we are a little bit too used to it sometimes. But maybe this is just a, a good reminder for how great and how powerful this wonderful gift is for us. God, I thank you so much. We thank you for the gift of your son, Yeshua, the Messiah. who we celebrate, not just today or in this month or this season, but Lord, this, is our, this should be our celebration every single day, every single hour. Where we celebrate that the veil was torn, that you allowed us to get into your presence. This is such a big deal. This would be something unheard of for centuries or probably even thousands of years. This, this would be something that the Israelites could have never thought or imagined. And here yet we are. We are right here in your presence and with your presence, God, and we thank you so much. Thank you for opening, for, for making this way into your presence, into the most holy place. And God, I pray for myself and for everybody here today. that you would even take us further into your presence, that we would get new ideas and new experiences of how precious your presence is. Lord, we don't just pray for ourselves. Lord, even uh, in this dark time here in Israel, but also outside of war and anything. God, we pray for your people. We pray that people would experience the gift of Yeshua to make a way into this presence. God, we pray for revelations. We pray for dreams. Whatever it takes, we pray 
that people would not just stop somewhere without getting into that most holy place. Without seeing your presence and understanding how you made this available to everyone. God, we pray that you would let your light in and that you would let your light shine bright so that there would be no, not, not even a doubt. We thank you in Yeshua's name. Amen. I want to close, and you can stand already, uh, but we're going to have a wonderful uh, gathering celebrating that light tonight. And you may have looked outside and it's like, Oh, why is it raining? But it doesn't matter if it rains. Uh, we only have to decide whether we're going to be inside or outside. Uh, but no matter what, no matter what the weather is like, uh, we are meeting here tonight at 5.30. And I think the official program starts at 6. Uh, but we have a few vendors here uh, for Hanukkah, for some uh, Christmas uh, items that they're going to sell seasonal items and we have some drinks we have some cookies so it's not it's not a cookie event okay uh, we are celebrating uh, Yeshua um, with, with uh, songs we, we have some specials as well uh, we're gonna have some Hanukkah songs as well so it's gonna be a fun time don't let the rain stop you um, just know we're gonna be meeting no matter what so, invite your friends, if you haven't, if there is somebody on your mind. Um, it's, it's a nice way of, of inviting people. Let's pray and let's receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face to you and give you his shalom, his peace. Amen. Have a wonderful Shabbat. Enjoy your six hours of a little bit of a break. And then we, we expect you right here, back. Shabbat shalom. <laughs>